all five unit forms that are going to make up this bracelet are completed. The backing paper has been glued in place, the edges are sanded nicely, the channels will eventually be melted out. I still have to apply the watercolor paper to the top. And you know what I'm talking about. You've seen me do it in previous videos. Actually, there's a lot of nice stuff going on in this scrap paper I have laying around. I could use that. Or maybe I'll create a new piece painted specifically for this new bracelet. I like that idea. So the first step is to trace my basic shapes. I should mention that this is 140 pound watercolor paper, Arches watercolor paper. Now I have an assortment of color prepared. I like these bins. I think I've talked about this before. They're a beautiful way of keeping your paints contained. I also have a palette over on the side that's ready to go. I plan to use a variety of brushes. A three-quarter inch angle brush. A much smaller angle brush. Less than a half inch. A number six round brush. And of course I have that bottle. I've gotten many requests as to what is this bottle? Where do I buy it? First thing I'll do is wet the entire area. I want the color to flow nicely throughout. And I'm not really planning anything specific. I'm just going to take some basic colors and work them in. That's a permanent rose. Now into the permanent rose I'm going to throw its complement. In this case I'm using Windsor Blue. Antwerp Blue might be a nice possibility instead of the Windsor Blue. Good. This puts me in the mood to do a watercolor. I want the paint to intermix on its own. A few little dabs of scarlet red thrown into this might be very effective. The point I need to make is I'm trying to achieve an abstract flow of color without directly mixing it on the paper with my brush. Mixing it on the paper with the brush will muddy the colors, allowing them to flow naturally on their own and mingle will create very interesting color effects. As it begins to dry, I'm going to sprinkle a little bit of salt into it. As you can see, the watercolor is nice and dry now. The salt created all of these unusual effects. I like the natural color progressions that have happened on the paper. Very beautiful. See how the colors intermixed? I never actually added a mixed green, but they mixed on the paper very beautifully. That'll make a nice bracelet. The next step is to cut out the individual pieces. The 
the individual pieces have been cut out and now we're ready to start the gluing and attaching them to their basic shapes. The way I approach this is I, I put a little bit of glue on the form itself, like so. You don't need a lot of glue for this purpose, I just want to get it coated. Then I'll put some glue on that. I always work on a piece of paper towel. This way I, I can freely brush the glue, not worry about it getting all over the place, and then simply lift my piece without getting any glue on the surface. But here's a little trick that I use now. Now this needs to be worked down. Move it over a bit to a clean area. And fold my paper over. And begin to work it down. This is fine. Any excess glue that's squeezed out will be absorbed by the paper towel and not mess up the surface of the newly painted watercolor paper. Can you see this? The layer that I want to glue down. Paper is still a bit stiff. Not until it absorbs the moisture from the glue and becomes hydrated will it become flexible enough to be able to bend down. It's actually getting there now. The way I like to accelerate this process is to take a piece of this glad pressure seal wrap. I do this with my pendants and with my earrings, not only the bracelet. I tear a piece. And what I will do is position the piece inside the wrap and continue to press it down. The advantage of this is I can see what I'm doing because the wrap is clear and since it's totally sealed the moisture level is going to increase in there. Paper is, is going to soften nicely and with that on, in place I can effectively burnish it down without damaging the painting. So there's a lot of advantages to covering it with a piece of uh, glad wrap. You can also see what you're doing, which is nice. That is nice. Well, I'm going to continue to do that with the remaining four. I'd like to just mention that when using this method, of sealing it in glad wrap. Don't leave it in too long. Only because this is so effective at hydrating the paper, eventually the watercolor will become wet and you could lift some of the, the pigment up, reducing the strength of the colors. I've only had it sealed for maybe a minute and I can tell the paper is thoroughly conformed to the unit form underneath. So I will take it out. Yeah, see some of the watercolor already came up? No big deal. But you don't want to leave it in too long and make it worse. All five pieces are, are glued in place now. And they're, they're wet. They have to dry. Once again, we have a rough form. The top layer has to be integrated with the bottom layers. I really like what happened with the watercolor. It's going to be a nice bracelet. Now that the watercolor paper is glued in place and dry, I let it dry overnight. It's time to sand the edges in an effort to refine the shape. And what I just did is 
work the edges of this piece. This is finished. This just needs to have the, the paint added to the side and I can start to varnish it. But the edges now are nice and clean. You see here they're still rough. One of the first things I do before I actually start sanding is I'll take a pair of scissors and cut off any overlap. All it is is a piece of paper so it's easy to trim this way, a lot quicker than sanding. That's nice. Having done that, I'll continue to sand the edges with 120 grit sandpaper until I achieve a nice smooth surface where everything is even. All the pieces have been refined. The edges on each individual unit have been sanded down. I also took extra care to round the corners. Now what remains is to paint the edge. And here's how I like to do this. You can also dampen the back if you would like to allow the colors to just sort of run into the back. Using my flat brush, start to flow colors into the edge that suggest the colors that I used on top. Go to my blue. Be careful that you don't transfer paint to the surface. Oh, that's nice. There's no need to go totally crazy with your colors. You can keep them simple and limited to just a few like I'm doing here. And I think I'm going to go to my quinacridone gold for the final touch. Or brown matter. Whatever you like. Totally up to you. Have fun with the colors. Create effects that make you happy. The individual units are complete with their top layer of an abstract watercolor painting. I like allowing the, um, the paint to simply bleed into the back paper. And I mentioned before this is banana paper. And to complete it, I painted the edge with watercolor paint and simply allowed the fluid colors to flow into one another. What do we do next? we varnish the piece. To varnish the piece I use a water-based polycrylic varnish to build up layers of a clear hard gloss finish and I like to apply my varnish with a relatively wide brush. This little thing here is a tray that I made out of paper. I angle the paper. See how it is? Glued in place using the same white glue that I made the bracelet out of. And what this does is allows me to arrange my pieces without having them touch one another. And then I'll place this whole thing after it's been varnished in the oven. And I believe you're already familiar with the process if you watch my watercolor pendant video series. The process involves heating the jewelry in a toaster oven between coats of varnish at 150 degrees. This accelerates the drying time of the varnish and actually creates a much harder varnish surface than if I let it dry on its own. Of course, you can let it dry on its own. There's no need to use the toaster oven. Although, you will need to melt out the wax that we use to create the channel. So, I guess a toaster oven is unavoidable. Let me remove this from here. When I varnish my pieces, I like to lay them down on a paper towel. For the first coat of varnish, I apply one or two flows of varnish onto the surface of the watercolor paper and I avoid brushing into it because brushing into it has the potential 
of messing up your paint. Remember, the varnish is water base. Your watercolor is water base. So the water base varnish could act as a solvent to redissolve your watercolor and move paint around. You don't want to do that. Here's what I mean. Minimal brushwork. The varnish will flatten out on its own. You don't have to worry about that. The watercolor really comes alive when you apply that coat of varnish. The varnish enhances the richness of the watercolor. All of the uniforms have been given their first coat of varnish. Of course, I still have to varnish the side and the back, but I saved the back for last. Is I could, I could actually leave them on the paper towel and put it in the oven, but I prefer to do this. I prefer to take them, carefully place them on my paper contraption, allow them to air dry for a few minutes, until it's a nice matte surface, and then I'll place them in the oven, maybe 10 minutes at 150 degrees. No more than 150 degrees, because all I really want to do is accelerate the drying process to speed up the process of making the bracelet. I don't want to have to wait an hour between coats. I'd rather wait 15 minutes between coats. But I also don't want to melt out the wax at this point. So that's why I keep the temperature only at 100, 150 degrees. When it comes time to melt out the wax, I'll raise the temperature to around 200. Time to place it in the oven. After the first coat has been applied and it's been baked in the oven for at least 15 minutes, I take it out, let it cool down before I apply the second coat. But I should say that if you like the look of the pieces, at this point, that's fine. Leave it alone. You don't have to build it up to a gloss finish. I do that because I like it. Sometimes I do prefer to keep it more satin and allow the texture of the paper to show through. So that's, that's a personal call. You don't have to go crazy with the varnishing. These are looking good. I'm going to proceed to give it their second coat. And I do let it air dry before I actually return it to the oven because I fear by putting it in the oven prematurely I could get some kind of bubbling. Maybe not, but I don't want to take a chance. I just took the second layer out of the oven. What do I look for to determine if it's dry? I don't want to see any milky white areas. It needs to be totally clear. Yet, with only two layers, the uh, paper is still highly textured, which kind of looks nice, but I'm going to continue to build it to a rather slick surface. You might want to consider making yourself a tool to be able to hold on to these while you varnish them. What I'll often do is cut a length, and in this case, five lengths of nickel silver wire, Bend it to create a little handle and insert it into the, the wax. Gives you something to hold on to while you're varnishing. I'm going to continue to varnish the unit forms that will compose the bracelet. And now I'm also going to start to paint the sides. The primary objective behind varnishing is to make your watercolor paper, jewelry, waterproof. Why don't I paint the back? For a very specific reason. When I put it in the oven to heat it, water vapor has to outgas. If I seal the shape completely in varnish, it may result in trapped water vapor causing the varnish to blister. There's no way for it to vent out. But by leaving it opened in the back,
the water vapor can vent out. And it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have a problem if you varnish it. I just very occasionally have run into that issue and noticed it happens when I varnish the entire thing. Of course, ultimately you do have to varnish the whole thing, but hopefully it will be dehydrated enough by that time. And since you're only applying a light coat on the back, it won't cause any bubbling or blistering. When I take the pieces out of the oven, I allow it to cool before I either apply another coat or I sand the surface slightly. And when I say sand, maybe that's a bad choice of words. I very lightly buff the surface after, let's say, the third coat. Give it a light buffing with very fine paper. For this, I'm using 400 grit sandpaper. I'm just taking off the slight edge roughness. I'm not really sanding it. I'm scuffing it. You can feel the difference. And that's what I'm after. More the feeling rather than the look, because the look changes only minimally. But the feeling, it's nice and smooth now. Whereas if I feel this, it's not buffed yet. It's actually rough. Let's move on to the absolute final stage of preparing the actual unit forms for the bracelet. I've given each one a few coats of varnish, sanding between the coats, and I like the finish. What I'll do now is apply one coat of varnish to the back. That'll effectively seal it from moisture, making it waterproof. There we go. And I'll, I'll brush around the edge too. Now that the fronts and the backs have been satisfactorily varnished, it's time to allow the wax to flow out. How do I do this? With a sharp object, I'm going to poke a hole in the varnish that has sealed over the wax. Careful not to damage anything. I position them on this homemade tray like this to allow any wax to flow out. And I'll probably have to clean up these holes a little better because right now they're not looking too good. But we're ready to go. Uh, removed it from the oven just to check the progress of the wax melting. And, and there you can see it. it is oozing out. The objective after you've taken this out of the oven is to be able to to make sure the hole is cleaned out nicely of wax. What I've done is I've taken a, a piece of really heavy gauge weed whacker cord and I've cut a length off and I've sanded the top to make it round. See, I've rounded the tip. And that's an effective tool for ramming through the piece when it's still warm and pushing out any excess wax. Also, it helps redefine the shape of the opening and it makes it round. Sometimes I'll actually cut lengths of this weed whacker cord, put the piece back in the oven, and subject it to more heat. It actually helps form the channel in a nice way. This universal trimmer line happens to be 0 0.095 inches in diameter or 2.4 millimeters. Because yeah. it's flexible, the material responds to the gentle curve of the piece. If you tried this with a nail, you wouldn't be able to do that. Why do this? Because while the material is hot, 
it has the ability to expand ever so slightly when you push something into it. This helps create a nice opening to pull your jewelry cord or your leather through. See? It's often easier, though, to grab this with a pair of pliers and work it in that way. And this is perfect. So what I will do now is remove the nylon material and save it for another day. Having done that, I'll take my very fine 400 grit sandpaper and any roughness that may have occurred around the opening, I'm going to sand away. I don't want to take away from the shine of the piece. I just want to smooth out the rough edge and then maybe insert this in again. Yeah, have a nice round opening now. See that? That's perfect. We are approaching the final stage. I'm about to thread through two millimeter black leather cord. This little trick I showed you using weed whacker cord enabled me to, while this was hot, to continue to work the channel and make it nice and wide. It's the diameter now of this weed whacker cord that is slightly larger than the diameter of this material. Also keep in mind, because I used candles in some of these unit forms to create the channel, I needed to work out the leftover wick after the wax was melted out. Arrange them the way you like. And when you're happy, take the cord. See how nicely it passes through? I hope this works as well for you. You can run into problems sometimes. I never encountered anything that couldn't be solved. Okay, there's a glitch right there. It's not passing through. So I'll take the stiff material and work it back and forth a little bit more. Now I'll try to pass it through. There we go. If you run into a problem doing this stage, drop me an email and uh, let me know what, what's not working for you and we'll try to figure it out together. If we measure out the length of this, it's eight inches, almost eight inches from end to end, seven and three quarter. Put that here. I'll cut a length of bamboo. I'm going to drill those holes out so I can easily pass my leather cord through. I drilled out the holes using a, uh, a drill bit large enough to allow me to insert the leather cord. That's nice. I also like to sand the edge a bit. Sometimes I'll, I'll actually dip this in varnish, and I may do that to this eventually, the ends in the varnish, to prevent it from fraying. So what needs to be done now is I need to apply it to the end of my 
my bracelet. I'm going to insert that in, and I will insert that in. Now, what I want to do on the end here, I said I'm going to go a little fancier. Instead of tying a knot, I've had this idea that in place of the knot, I would use these square beads. I think that's going to look really nice. I suggest you stick to the knot idea. It's very simple to do. It looks fine. It's nice. I'm showing you an alternative. What I'm doing here is I took these wooden beads and I carefully drilled out the holes to make them much larger. The original hole in that bead is very tiny. I can never pass it on to the leather. And I'm doing this for the aesthetics of the piece. I simply like this look, but it's not necessary. You see, I've got to give this away as a gift. And I want to make it a little fancier. Place the bead on the leather. I'm going to take some crazy glue and very carefully, carefully, I apply it so it sucks into the opening. We'll give it a few minutes, let it set up. Apply a dot of crazy glue to the other bead. Yes. And as I see it suck in, I apply a little bit more. The capillary action pulls it right in. I hope you enjoyed watching this video series. I enjoyed making it.